these last few sections to the unit may seem a little bit out of place when we're talking about dynamics, but I assure you it's all somewhat interconnected. So we're going to talk a little bit about space exploration, or certain aspects of space exploration that have to do with circular motion and the forces involved in that circular motion. Now it's not circular motion exactly, because planets actually move in elliptical orbits, but we'll get to that. So first of all, the ancient Greeks believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system. Today we know that's incorrect, or most of us know that's incorrect, um, but that was their operating worldview. Ptolemy was one of those who advocated that, and just to give you a sense of when that was happening, Ptolemy was around 150 AD. Now, when we look at Johannes Kepler, he actually took measurements about planetary motion. Everything up, till now, up until then was just Greek thought. It was philosophers, not so much science being done or testing or measurements. Kepler changed all that when he started taking measurements of planets' motions in 1600 AD. Isn't that insane? That's so far past 150 AD that the Earth was believed to be the center of the solar system. So he had three main findings. The first one was that objects move around the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. If you are familiar with the geometry of ellipses, an ellipse is something like this. That's really not a great ellipse, but they're really hard to draw freehand. So you get an ellipse when you connect two points, you call them foci, or a, a focus, multiple foci, and if you connect the two of them to a point on the outside, the sum of those two distances, we would call them the sum of two radii, um, will always equal the same number no matter where you pick on the outside of the ellipse. So that plus that will give you the same thing as those first two marks we made. This one over here, we get this plus these, these, those two <laughs> radii equal the same number. And so an ellipse is the locus of points or the set of all points um, who have the same sum of radii from both of those foci. So he said that objects move around the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. And so what that looks like is this. Oh man, my ellipse is terrible. <clears throat> Here's one of the foci. We're going to say this is the sun. And so objects would move around the sun in elliptical orbits. Now this is very, very exaggerated. The, the elliptical orbit that the Earth takes around the Sun, for instance, is, is almost circular. It's very, very close. It is technically, technically elliptical, but it, we can almost consider it to be a circular orbit. Now, a circle is a type of ellipse. It's just that with a circle, both foci are in the same spot. That's it. It's still an ellipse. It's just a special kind of ellipse, just like a square is a special kind of rectangle. And so the distance from the planet, wherever it is, to the sun, we would call that r, right over there. But because it's an elliptical orbit, that r changes. The r over here is different than the r over here, right? So we would call this one r max, the maximum distance that the planet is from the sun. And this one, we, we would call it r min. We could also call these things aphelion. And r min would be called perihelion. I can spell this. There you go. You don't need to know those things for this particular course, but, you know, it's always nice to impress friends and neighbors. And so when we're figuring out some circular motion stuff, we have to just average those two things out. So our mean is really what we want to use, and that's just averaging out our max and our min. 
Okay, so that's where the the radius comes from that, that we're actually going to use. You're never going to actually do that calculation. You're only going to be told the mean radius of orbit is whatever. Okay, so you won't have to actually do that, but it's good to know. The second law that you came up with is that a straight line joining the sun and an object's path sweeps out equal areas in equal times. That's super confusing and is easiest with an animation. Unfortunately, I cannot do an animation or I don't have that skill, so I'm going to try and draw this as a still picture. So here is our elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus. Again, very much exaggerated. And so we're going to look at starting here with the Earth. So if we join the Earth and the Sun with a straight line, and let's say that moving from here to here takes 30 days. And now we're over here, and we're going to join this with another straight line. So this is an area that has been swept out by the Earth's movement. Okay, you've attached a rope from the sun to the Earth, and as the Earth has moved around the sun, that rope has swept out an area that's almost like a triangle, but isn't quite. Then, as the Earth moves again, another 30 days, the next 30 days will take it to here because this area is equal to the red area. Okay, but notice that this 30 days, the green 30 days, has actually taken the Earth a longer distance than the red 30 days. It's moving faster when it comes closer to the Sun. Okay, and that's what he found, that there's, that the Earth moves faster when it's closer to the Sun, but uh, there's a mathematical relationship to it. And so now, here where it's closest to the sun, the next 30 days might take it all the way over here. Now oh, this is not actually a very good approximation of what each 30 days is, but it gives you the idea. So each of these segments, each of these colored segments, um, is an equal area. It's just that the distance that the Earth travels in those times is greater the closer it is to the Sun. So the basic idea of this law is that the Earth is f moving faster when it's closer to the Sun and slower when it's farther away from the Sun. Or any object works that way. For the Earth in particular, again, the orbit is so close to circular that there's almost no difference. And in fact, where you would think that here in the Northern Hemisphere we would be experiencing winter over here because we're farther away, and it's so long, and you'd be thinking that this is summer over here because we're closer to the sun and it's so short. It's really the opposite. The Earth's orbit is so circular or so near circular that, it, that our season has, has more to do with the tilt of the Earth than the speed of its, of its traveling around the sun. So this is actually completely false, and don't memorize it. <laughs> Our final piece that uh, Kepler gives us is the following relationship. K equals r cubed over t squared. Now this is the version of the formula that we're going to use, but there are various versions of it. So you could rearrange this however you wanted to, and it would give you a very similar thing. So sometimes you'll see it like this, r cubed equals kt squared, or various other ways, but they're, they're all very, very much the same. So k is Kepler's constant. It's always the same number, or always nearly the same number. It's 3.35 times 10 to the 18 meters cubed per second squared. This r is the distance between planetary centers. And strangely enough, that needs to be measured in meters, or you need to use a different k value. Okay, so notice that our k value, it's measured in 
meters cubed per second squared. Not that the units really matter for your calculations at all, but that does mean that you need to use meters in the distance between planetary centers. So we're talking about the distance from the center of one planet to the center of the other. Okay, not the surface to surface distance. And this t is the orbital period. How long does it take to go around the sun once? And that gets measured in seconds, which is crazy, right? Because the Earth going around the sun is a lot of seconds. And so this m value is a very big number, and this s value is a very big number. Okay, so we're going to use this relationship in order to do a few calculations. Can you figure out uh, the distance of something from the sun if you know how long it takes to go around it? Okay, that's a useful calculation if you're an astronomer. So let's try it once. A small asteroid orbits the sun every 30 days. How far is it from the sun? The only information it tells us is this 30 days thing. But we know that anything that goes around the sun is going to use the same k value. And so we know that k is 3.35 times 10 to the 18 meters cubed per second squared. So we already have one variable for that from that equation, even though it doesn't tell us anything about that. It also tells us the orbital period, t. It's 30 days, but we don't want it in days, we want it in seconds. So 30 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. That will give you the orbital period. That's 2,592,000 seconds. So now we have the k and the t value. Now we can figure out the r value. So k equals r cubed over t squared. And we can rearrange that to get the r by itself. So the r value, the distance from the center of the sun to the center of the asteroid, is the cube root of kt squared. So we get r equals the cube root of 3.35 times 10 to the 18 times 2, 5, nine two zero 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 squared cube rooting all of that gets us 2.8 times 10 to the 10 meters that's the distance from the center of the sun to the center of the asteroid